We we could still talk. What's up? Sweet. I was wondering if Kirsten could um, redo her name. Are we going to see her name? No. Okay, cool. All right. What do you mean? Cool. Welcome, everybody, to this new episode of Pixels and Paint. I have with me uh, Mark Bamuthi Joseph and Kirsten Magwood from Black Dignity Future Classics. Um, So I guess my first question for you guys... First off, welcome. Um, hey. Is maybe you could give our, our audience a um, brief introduction to yourselves if they're not familiar with you. Kirsten, maybe we can start with you. My name is Kirsten Magwood. I am a producer. I am a connector. I am a content creator. I am a troublemaker. I am a disruptor. And um, I am here with this particular project, hoping to disrupt a bit of the NFT world and the art world, all for the good of advancing Black dignity through classical arts and music. Cool, thank you. And Mark? Sweet, Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, My name is Mark Famuti Joseph, and I am a first-generation American. Uh, My people come from Haiti. I'm a father and an artist. Um, My medium is um, primarily um, written language for the live moment, whether that's the musical moment or the operatic moment. Um, My square job is uh, here at the Kennedy Center where I'm joining you today. I'm the vice president of social impact here and the artistic director of cultural strategy. Great, thank you. Um, maybe you guys can give me a little background on Black Dignity Future Classics, which is the, the drop series that we have coming up, but it's also related to other projects that are, that are going on at the Kennedy Center and elsewhere. Yeah. I'll let you sure. take Kirsten, it. you want to grab that? Why you grab that one. You, <laughs> you, started this, you started this good trouble. I guess I'll start mm. to say that Mark started the good trouble of creating a project at the Kennedy Center yeah. called the Cartography Project. We commissioned mm-hmm. composers on the brightest of color, create symphonies and operas to restore black dignity in communities where have been robbed by racial violence. And each of those pieces was dedicated to an iconically murdered African-American. That collective of artists, the composers, the librettists and visual artists that came together for that project are really the foundation and the core members of Black Dignity Future Classics joined, of course, by other artists who have that same desire to see um, the classic art of the future reflective of Black dignity in new and interesting ways. (laughs) Yeah, um, Kirsten Kirsten dropped it. So that's the, the genealogy of Black dignity future classics is that it is rooted in this idea that we have these Western traditions. Um, And at the time, here at the Kennedy Center, we have um, two uh, larger classical organizations, the National Symphony Orchestra and the Washington National Opera. Um, In my role as Vice President of Impact here, um, the gig is really to serve as an architect of our impact strategies. And um, an overall theory of change, which focuses on this idea of design infrastructure. Um, I have known Kirsten for um, a long time, and as part of the cartography project, wanted to enlist her creativity um, and her intellect, um, as well as her um, curatorial savvy, to see um, what the relationship might be um, between um, these musical compositions and visual culture. I think you're um, And she um, really brilliantly thought about this way that um, not only could we kind of intersect these composers and librettists from around the country with um, prominent and emerging visual artists, especially in, in the digital space and in the technological space, but that there might also be a way to think about Um, a financial ecosystem and a financial ecology that could pair um, inevitably the the sale of NFTs that were inspired by these compositions 
to um, certain foundations that were aligned with, let's say, Philando Castile or aligned with um, Breonna Taylor. It's a lot of red tape at the Kennedy Center. Um, and so we weren't able to fully realize that vision, but um, being independently spirited and also knowing the, the urgency um, around this work and the propagation of this work, um, we came back around to creating this independent entity that draws from thematically um, you know, these ideological roots, but um, operates in a space of greater freedom and also foregrounds visual culture um, even more. So this is a, a project, but it's not a passion project. It is both a project and it is also our passion to foreground Black dignity through the arts. I think of it really as like a purpose project. Um, when Mark first tapped me in to pair the musical work with visual artwork, the idea was to give it a visual life that reflected the people who the work was honoring. This was gonna be two very large bodies of musicians that were all white playing these songs to um, these iconically murdered African-Americans. So the idea was to create an aesthetic that also reflected the tone and the purpose of the music. Add to that, because Mark's charge is social impact, the bigger question became, how does it become an impactful project, not just an important project? And right. so what we learned through cartography was that, you know, in these large bodies of classical musicians, and I'm a longstanding fan of opera and symphony, when you go to the opera, go to the symphony, you don't see black people, maybe an usher. Mm. Um, the fact that we have one of the foremost black composers is a part of this project. Black composers who are on the rise um, who are not finding space. Um, the idea with this project is really to create space, to create support for artists who are doing something that's going against the grain of their industry and mm -hmm. usually going against the grain of what their family imagined they might do. So the idea is to create a support and visibility um, for these very important artists who are going to be shaping what we call classic tomorrow. You know, 50 years, hip hop gets celebrated its 50th anniversary. We now acknowledge there's classic hip hop in the same way that there's classic rock and classical music. And mm -hmm. so the idea is to celebrate these architects and artists who are bringing this sound and visual landscape to life um, by creating a fan base, a direct to collector relationship through NFTs. Mm -hmm. I first fell in love with NFTs during the pandemic, um, sort of in the clubhouse world and seeing them as a great tool for the empowerment of artists. Only in America, artists do not get residual income for their secondary sales. NFTs are a great solve for that. Most artists have no idea where their art is actually living. Well, NFTs give you a direct to collect relationship so you can always track your art. So being a curator in the art world, I saw NFTs as having a lot of solutions for the art world. And I know there's- Chris some... is breaking up a little bit. It's me too, yeah, yeah they're, they're, I think we're both breaking up. Because I, um, was... <laughs> I thought Mark was breaking up, so I'm breaking up too. Let's he see. wasn't breaking up on my end. There it is. And I could, right, so it's maybe me. It's my, my machine. Um, what can I do? Uh, I'm on. Maybe just quit some things. Are there tabs you can close? Better connection. I switched, I switched, I switched, I switched to a different thing. So hopefully it's to be better. Um, we will see. Okay, yes. cool. Um, but the idea that NFTs really are a amazing tool for empowerment for artists, that artists can have a direct to relationship, they can track their artwork, they can establish provenance, and most importantly, they can get a secondary sale. I find that too often the fine art world preys on dead artists and starving artists. And I think art is a renewable resource, an amazing and important renewable resource, but only if artists eat. And to eat, they have to have money. And so the idea with this particular project is to raise money to create a pipeline and support network for these amazing classic artists. I want to take a step back um, and talk a little bit more about uh, Black artists in, cla in the classical realm, classical music and opera. What are the existing support structures or incentive structures that are available to help 
young black composers and, and classical musicians or singers? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I mean, the, the prevailing, I would say, service organization and conduit um, for artists in the classical realm is the Sphinx organization, which was founded by Aaron Dworkin and is now run by Afa um, Dworkin. Um, and that's been an incredible space um, to um, one kind of pipeline musicians um, into the space. Um, there, there are always kind of academies and uh, and institutions that um, you know. I, I think of two of my favorite composers, Carlos Simon and Daniel Bernard Romain, who both came out of the University of Michigan. Um, but ultimately, this is um, this is a, a curatorial game. So, um, you know, people like Jesse Norman or um, or Carlos or um, or Daniel, folks that are a little bit more um, kind of forward in their careers, really rely on the artistic directors at prominent opera companies and um, and orchestras, the musical directors to bring them into the fold. What you'll often hear, and this is something that we heard at the Kennedy Center, is these musical directors don't know where to look, which, you know, from where I'm sitting is just a, a matter of both um, perspective and effort because clearly there's um, an abundance of, of talent. It's not, you don't know where to look, it's um, um, how committed are you to looking and why? Um, there's a, a kind of pyramid of desire where most orchestras, most opera companies, um, they want to maybe diversify their programs and um, they definitely want to diversify their audiences. But that's the wrong question. Um, you know, there's kind of four, I think there are four levels to it. You know, the first question is, how do I diversify my audience? The second question is, how do I get my audience to belong? The, the third question is, um, how can I serve the community? And then the, the fourth question is, how do we serve the future? And the, the way to an answer the first question is by asking the last one. If you want diverse audiences, you have to be in service of the future. You don't like actually diversify audiences and you don't even diversify the, the canon of classical composers and librettists unless you're committed to the horizon. Um, and that's why um, we've occupied the particular posture that we have, because this isn't about um, diversifying the classical music space. This is about an equitable American future. And in order to get there, you have to be in service of um, the idea of shared stakes and shared responsibility. So shout out to Sphinx, but we need more um, kind of specific curatorial theorists and applicants that diversify the landscape for, um, I, I would say, deeper purposes um, beyond the topical. Kirsten, I wonder if there might be a, a place for these composers in the TV and film world, since it is through, you know, brute repetition that that music starts to become popular. And um, I'm curious, you know, it, are there composers, uh, young black composers, young or old black composers in TV and film working today that that our listeners should keep an ear out for? Um, absolutely. I think that when you are looking, I guess recently came back from an amazing film festival called the Black Star Film Festival. And one of the most notable things about the films I experienced was a beautiful and very diverse black sound palette. 
um, representing mm. sounds from Africa, representing sounds from classical music, representing drum and bass, representing house, representing every kind of music. I mean, if you look at sort of the history of all music, it kind of all goes back to black music. And so mm. when you ask if there's this in, in all in all soundtracks everywhere, um, I think you hear that. I mean, certainly the Black Panther was a huge flex of a wide sound palette of black music. And I guess that's the real thing is that sometimes we exist in a very narrow understanding of who we are as humans. And so part of this Black Disney Future Classics movement is to show a bigger range of black music, a bigger range of black art. When you go again to the symphony, the opera, to the average museum, the Louvre, the absence of black people is glaring. And so that when we look at tomorrow, it can't be that homogenous. We are actually the global majority. So if the global majority is not represented in the future, what does that actually mean? You know, it would, it would mean genocide for most of the planet, sincerely. And so creatively, I think we have to have a voice that represents and resonates with the planet. And I think that we've not always been good about that as a planet. And so it's an important corrective thing that can happen through art. I think art always leads the charge. Even when you start a campaign, propaganda starts with a slogan. It starts with art. It starts with a, sl a jingle. It starts with art. So all change, all um, mental change starts with art. And so I hope that this movement can help to, again, expand people's understanding of blackness, expand people's understanding of black creative output. You asked about film, for example. I know Carlos, who's working on this project, um, is going to be doing a, has done several soundtracks and is really looking to expand more in that world. Listen to the, again, the Black Panther soundtrack. You have a really beautiful range of sound there. So um, I think there's a lot out there already. I wanted to ask you about how you found the artists to accompany these eight composers. And what was the selection process like? Are these um, commissioned works? Are these works that were already existing? Um, maybe you can walk me through that, that process so, a bit. So for the, for the initial project where we all kind of came together, which was the cartography project at the Kennedy Center, those were commissioned pieces. Each artist created unique pieces of work to match the storyline of those operas. One of the pieces that's featured in this comes directly from that original eight. So that was an original eight there, and we have an original eight. We resonate in eight because eight is the eighth, H is the eighth letter in the alphabet. White supremacists use eight eight as a power symbol. Hail Hitler is how they use eight. When Dylan Roof was charged, that case was settled for $88 million because the, the lawyers were trying to take a snub at white supremacy. And so we continue to reclaim eight as a symbol of infinite abundance that it is. And so that's how we come to keep resonating in the number eight. But as I said, Renee Cox, iconic photographer um, in the Library of Congress, in museums all over the world, currently at Guildhall in the Hamptons, she is the foremother of black portraiture. And so what I did was I used some of the work that she created just for this piece, but also mixed in some of her most iconic classics. So if you get this Renee Cox piece, you not only get original work that she created to speak to this cartography theme, specifically around coffee and the poem that Bamuthi actually uh, is the librettist for, but you also get some of her dopest work that you've only seen in museums. So the idea that you could live with both this new creation of Renee as well as her iconic pieces all together, I mean, it's a really special piece. Mm. And um, what about the other artists who are involved? There are other visual artists involved, right? Yes, okay, yes. So we, the eight artists that we have, um, they all come from different worlds. Uh, Adrian Wahid oddly came from Bamuthi's wall. <laughs> Bamuthi has some of Adrian's work in his home and I happened to meet Renee, I meet Adrian, and Adrian really resonated with me because her work is all about black joy. There is nothing that is more of an affront to white supremacy than black joy. Let some black kids be having a joyful moment on the sidewalk yeah. coming to get them. So mm. the idea of black joy being to me a real embodiment of what our ancestors' wildest dreams were, a joy that they were not always 
<laughs> able to explain mm. the rest of slavery, of Jim Crow, of this ongoing police brutality. Joy is a mm. space that we don't get to occupy often enough, but it is the thing that keeps us going. It is the thing that keeps mm. the black community alive. We are so joyful in spite of all of the atrocities and, and that is our superpower. And so mm -hmm. Adrienne beautifully captures that in her work. It's the theme of her work. It is a book that she's published. And so she immediately resonated with me. And I didn't even really connect that I'd seen her work in your house initially when I met her, but her work just spoke so deeply to the theme. Joshua and Jessica Mays. Jessica Mays was one of the original artists commissioning the Cartography Project. She tapped in her brother for visual art for that project. He tapped her in when I tapped him in for this particular exhibition. And so they work lovely together in terms of creating a really interesting and futuristic sort of like audio visual um, pairing. Charm Taylor, I met at ETH Denver. Charm is amazing. She'd taken over ETH Denver with her healing um, vibes. She had a whole clique of women coming, bringing sound bowls and healing tinctures and prayer to people at an NFT conference. And they mm. were like all in. She, she creates experience. She is a vibe. And mm. so I was so pleased when she not only created this beautiful and impactful piece of work, but she also created the music, the meditation music to go with it. And the person mm. who gets this NFT will also get access to her new wellness studio, which is based in New Orleans, but in true charm fashion, also in the metaverse and, and online. So that's a really, really special piece. Chris Friday is someone who I discovered in the art world. I was just a fan of her work. I love what she does. She's an mm. art educator. She's super down to earth. Her work is just so grounded in like everyday reality, but in the most like beautiful way. So I, I think Chris does a really beautiful job of capturing that everyday thing of just existence. Our existence mm. as black people is resistance because there's mm -hmm. a constant bullet on our back. And so surviving, just being, just being is what I think Chris captures so beautifully um, and the real significance of, of that. Um, Wildcat Ebony Brown is uh, an, an old school NFT, is an old school artist um, and activist and artist. She's part of the Wide Awake Clicks, part of Hank Willis Thomas Wide Awake Clicks, which is a cadre of visual artists who are also rooted in this same spirit of change. They are constantly creating work to push back on the white supremacist narrative that is particularly prevalent in the art world. Ebony's a leader in that cadre. She is a divine goddess. She's also one of those like meditation warriors, like just to be around Ebony is a specific kind of peace and vibe. I love this piece here. It's probably the one I could live with the most. She's doused in glitter. And if you met Ebony, she literally is like a glitter disco ball. Like that's her whole vibe and energy. Awesome. And it's still also just very peaceful. I think when you look at the history of black people in America, that's a thing that we've constantly been robbed of. I can't even say that to this day that I have that. And that's peace. I've always got my head on swivel for the cops, for a situation. Like that's part of being black in America, raising your sons and brothers to have a specific way to be just to stay home, just to get home at night, just to survive. So that survival situation that has always been sort of like an obstacle for us um, does not provide a lot of peace. And I really love Ebony's peace because I think it brings you into that peaceful um, space. Um, Austin Dean Ashford is actually part of uh, Bamuthi's cadre of a brilliant Oakland poets. I'm not really into poetry, but Oakland does represent. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> How to give it up to Oakland with the poets. And Austin Dean Ashford is truly a standout star. I don't know why when I went to see Austin perform, I thought he was going to be like barefoot and like waxing poetic. And then he pulls up the ukulele and he plays the piano and he's a full on rock star. Really in that like, almost like little Richard tradition of like, I do everything, you know? And so Austin is just extremely talented. The song he plays in this NFT is just infectious to me. He says, we got the juice in the sauce. We got the juice in the sauce. I can't, I keep thinking that is, and it's called God sauce. And it's mm. a real narrative, a conversation um, 
with everyone about having confidence about that God being, that, mm. that God being that lives in us. And so it's a real, um, it's a real like amp song. It's like my morning song. Like, I got, you know, it's the song you listen to in the morning. And, and Austin is that energy 24 seven. He's like a big kid. He's super colorful. Part of the tribe of mismatched socks. I discovered I, I don't wear matching socks. Austin is not, not matching socks. There's a whole crew of us. Part of the black people. <laughs> Matching socks. The, the, the machine ate them all. Anyway, Austin is a um, dynamic musician. He's also like a, a, a triple threat. He's a debate champion. Uh, he's a debate champion who went to the school Wiley, which was featured in The Great Debaters, um, Denzel's movie, The Great Debaters. In 2015, Denzel came back to his school, saw Austin perform once, paid for his whole college tuition, and wrote his MFA recommendations. And now Austin went from being a high school dropout to being a PhD candidate. And so um, I think if there's nothing like truly living your ancestors while screams, Austin is like that dude. Um, you know, because one, one of his classmates in high school committed suicide and it led him to a place of not being able to really fully engage because black death is part of our reality so young and how it affects a young person that they would withdraw from school. A young bright person who's a PhD candidate, you know, I think it speaks to the journey that we're really trying to support this idea um, of the need to keep pushing, keep being joyful and keep rising in the spirit of our ancestors. Did I leave anyone out? I feel like I might've left someone out. Fahamu? Fahamu, oh my gosh. I don't even know where to begin talking about Fahamu. Fahamu is a long-standing favorite artist of mine who I was honored to meet just as we were starting this pro uh, as we were working on this process and his work just and his whole way of being is that black dignity. He's such a, a, a scholar and an intentional artist and the art he makes is both grounded in like African tradition, African American street culture, and his own wild and crazy mind. He is um, perhaps one of the greatest uh, visual artists in the rise. He's in the Smithsonian African American Museum of Art, also at every art fair you go to. He's that guy you want in your collection if you're collecting art, because you know you won't be able to afford it sometime, at some point. It's, it's, it's only on the rise. And so um, I've been a long standing fan of his art. I was honored to meet him and glad he, he got the vibe of what we're doing um, and the importance of, you know, really paying it forward. He's a seasoned artist. He's making his way. But to reach back and make sure that there is a way for the next lane of painters and visual artists whose parents can't afford to send them to art school and all that stuff, because that's another part of the hustle with the art world is, you know, the pedigree and where did you go to school and all mm. these things that matter that people of color are traditionally boxed out of systematically. And now even more deliberately with the changes in the civil and in the, in the uh, Supreme Court. So, you know, we are really fighting um, an uphill battle at a very critical time in America's history where there is a deliberate push over the past five years to dial back progress, to dial back the progress of our ancestors. So as the role pushes back, we push it back forward. Um, we pay it forward we continue to resonate in the spirit of, of joy and hope and, and dignity that took us all this far. Mm. Can you describe the piece, The Road Ahead? Mm. Well, I'll let Mark start with that because he laid the foundation for The Road Ahead. Um, Mark Mamuthi Joseph and Carlos Simon collaborated to create this beautiful, beautiful opera. And they make a lot of beautiful operas together. So I'll pass that one to Mark to talk about the foundation. And I can talk more about Renee. Sure, thanks, Kirsten. Um, the Road Ahead, so um, I, I've been working in the performance space for uh, 25 years. For those of us that are watching that are in New York, um, I've been commissioned by the Guggenheim Museum and the Brooklyn Academy of Music. If you're in Los Angeles, I've been commissioned by the Music Center. If you're in Chicago, the, the Harris Theater and uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art, just um, all, all over the map. And um, early on in my career, particularly coming on as an educator, 
um, or, or someone who worked with young writers and who performed myself, I was often kind of um, brought in by these institutional spaces to do these workshops for young people. And I always left really dissatisfied because there was this kind of, um, um, kind of this some textual energy, I would say that, you know, like I would come in, I would parachute in, I would do a two hour workshop with young people. And if we didn't end patriarchy, if we didn't end white supremacy, if we didn't, you know, if all those things weren't done, somehow the project itself, that the workshop itself, um, as joyful as it might have been and as productive as it might have been, somehow didn't actually do its job. So the road ahead as a story um, kind of interrogates that pattern among institutions um, by creating a, an allegory of someone who wants to do something more, who also is put in the position of answering all these complicated questions that are actually not of her devising. Um, a black woman who um, has to bear the burden of um, kind of um, eviscerating all these social pathologies with a word or with a dance or with a song. The, the road ahead ultimately is an allegory about someone who just um, wants institutions and wants the world around her to walk the walk, to use culture as brick for a road that will get us to the other side. It's, it's a story about a, a woman on an island who needs to cross over to experience something better. Um, and ultimately that's the place where not only this project wants to go, but I think um, is, a, is a necessary road for the country to walk. What is the design? You know, one of the things that we say is the Constitution is a document that authors American freedom. Um, what is the role of the artist in the contemporary authorship of American freedom? The road ahead is um, a, a piece that begins to examine that. And the process of creating it really came first from um, a, a kind of, I don't know, imagining of this woman in space at pre-dawn. Um, it became a, a poem that I wrote and um, recorded into my phone. I sent that recording to Carlos, and I want to say within 36 hours, Carlos sent back the first draft of response, um, and it became, I, I think, a, a, a really gorgeous work, co-commissioned by the National Symphony Orchestra and the Washington National Opera. Um, when I was trying to explain um, cartography in its embodiment to Kirsten, um, I sent her the draft that Carlos sent to me. Um, and I, I think it is kind of like the thesis in a lot of ways for what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and so then we were honored to bring, um, to have Kirsten um, bring Renee into the project um, to interpret the work um, in a way that I, I think honors the vision, but also honors her genius. Yeah, I feel like the road, the, oh, sorry. No, sorry, you go ahead. I feel like the road ahead is so important because it is sort of the marquee piece of this project in that it sets the tone and sets the conversation. And Carlos, most of the artists who are in this fold or many of the artists in the first cartography fold were emerging composers in the books. Mark, Renee, Carlos are already iconic. and. What I love about the mix of them is they represent different eras in a way. And so Carlos is kind of the new era. Renee is essentially old school. Mark definitely sets a middle. Um, but them coming together in this messaging was just so beautiful. And 
Renee really is the woman that they were talking about in the poem. So it was very, it was like a natural thought for me. Renee is the future. Renee is super concerned with the road ahead for black people. Um, she's always been a forebearer and a boundary pusher and an artist. She's never just made art um, for the sake of art. She was actually banned in New York by Rudolf Giuliani for her painting where she depicted her of the, of the Last Supper. She depicted herself as Jesus with 12 black disciples and got banned by Rudolf Giuliani. What better could an artist say than I got banned by Rudolf Giuliani? Yeah. I mean, those are the best bragging rights ever. And, and that's yeah. totally Renee's spirit. She's always ahead of her time. Renee was also already into the NFT space. When I tapped Renee in for NFTs years ago, at first she resisted for like two minutes. And then before I could even get this NFT, she's already done an NFT drop. So Renee is really that OG artist who also reflects the future. And what we use in this particular NFT is that reference. That mm. reference that Carlos shared with Mark is the base for this particular NFT. Because as Mark was explaining, we were initially doing these with the first cartography pieces, but those pieces were recorded by the National Symphony Orchestra and Washington National Opera. For these pieces, we are going to be re-recording those same pieces of work for this, for this Black Dignity Future Culture track project here on Maker's Place. We're re-recording that music with Black musicians. Again, creating the pipeline and support line for Black classical music by re-recording those original recordings with Black musicians. And of course, because Carlos had already played, Mark is the librettist and the vocalist, and Renee, are, it was all very easy for that one piece. And we will continue to bring forth some of those original eight as we continue to roll out um, our relationship with Maker's Place. We'll continue to share the work there. But again, recorded by Black artists who can really feel the struggle and feel the story of these pieces in a, in a very unique and special way. And I think they bring a, and breathe a special life into it because of our life experiences, our shared experiences as black Americans, black people mm. in America. Mm. Um, you know, there are some commonalities uh, that are most unfortunate that we all share in spite of mm. differences in cuisine and, and, and culture in different ways. We, we share certain albatrosses of white supremacy that mm. are, are a constant um, pain point that we're looking mm. to sort of topple, fix, mm. address, heal, if you will. Mm. Renee has an interesting history because I, in the research I was doing on her, she's also been, that wasn't her only time being banned in New York. There was, I believe, two full nude photographs in 1994 at the New Museum. I don't, I'm now having a hard time remembering the details, but there was one photo of her, uh, full figure nude, that caused quite a controversy. But that was only half of the original piece. The other half, they wouldn't hang, which was a, uh, a complimentary piece of a black man who was nude. Mm. Um, and that one wasn't even, wasn't even on the wall. He has appeared mm. now for the first time in the Hamptons. He's currently at her guild right. hall exhibition uh, for the first time. So, I mean, Renee, Renee is really a longstanding favorite of mine. She's really a woman after my own spirit, disruptive, purposed, um, and determined to advance um, and expand the view and perception of black people. Um, she's unapologetic. She's always naked. She looks great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, even as she approaches senior citizen age, she is phenomenal. And she's always stood proud in that. Um, she is always trying to start an important conversation with her work. And so this was just a natural fit for her because this is such an important conversation to have, voiced by iconic librettist, iconic composer, supporting the vision. And, um, you know, I love working with Renee. This is not my first time working with her. So. She's an old favorite and she always hits, she always gets it. And yeah. so I really love the new work, the stuff around coffee, which becomes the metaphor throughout the piece that she created mm -hmm. just for this piece. There's some stuff she did in the snow. So there's a lot of stuff that she created unique just for this NFT. But then again, I, I mean, I couldn't believe she let me into her archive like that. I mean, mm -hmm. I've layered in Pieta. I've let her in like, like your mama, your mama's last time. I mean, I've layered in all of these iconic Renee pieces while telling the story that really accented the story. And I mean, that was the beautiful thing. 
I mean, there's always a divine thing that comes with art, right? But mm -hmm. I actually helped to edit that particular piece. And so I edited that piece. And so pulling together the things, it came so natural. It was like for everything Mark said, there was a Renee image. And yes. so um, it was just a really poetic experience. Um, I love the words to that piece. Um, Mark's salute, that is just, I mean, it's one of my favorites. Um, and you have many, many dope work. In fact, I saw your TED talk today too. Mark is very humble. Mark uh, is a iconic wordsmith um, and a decor and, and a decorated educator. And more important than being a, a master wordsmith himself and creating work that stands the test of time and has rocked an entire generation. He's also been a great educator and raised a generation of wordsmith. Um, and so I, I just love the way your your ripples and waves continue. And every time I go to like look up something, like I look I looked at your TED Talks this weekend, and I was like, you know, I've, I've never seen the TED Talks. There's so much amazing work that you put out, brother. And I really appreciate your your voice, your lens, and equally important, your activism and Thank you, you raising a new generation um, to have voice and to use that voice for important things. Thank you, friend. Mark, I want to ask you about the writing of your piece. It, the way that you described it, it sounded really quite quick. I'm wondering how long was the poem that you sent Carlos? I think I think the piece is maybe five minutes, maybe five and a half minutes. But there's um, the there wasn't a um, there wasn't so much of a prompt. Um, we the making of art is not magic but it requires magic to be made and there is a time that I work um, typically after dark where I um, invite the magic in and maybe I spent too much time in the Bay Area you know what I mean but um, but I don't know if there's another way to say it, um, which I think is another really um, kind of strong connection to Renee's work. Um, Renee, who has um, challenged Western iconography of divinity, both by centering her own black body as divine, but also challenging the iconography of um you know, of, of Judeo-Christian um, uh, kind of folklore and epistemologies. Um, but there's, I, I, I want to say that the piece probably took me four hours across two nights. Um, it wasn't like, um, th there's some people that are deeply re ritualistic in terms of their process. They wake up at 7 a.m. and they write from, you know, 7.02 to 8.30 and then they begin their day. I'm not that dude. Um, I observe um, over the course of time. And also I am asked, and, and Kirsten alluded to it maybe, um, you know, TED being a, a familiar platform, um, I, I'm often asked to um, distill ideas in more administrative forms, I would say, um, formats that are more discursive and a little less figurative. So um, a lot of my creative process now is to take these um, concepts from the, the broader discourse and think about them in poetic and colorful ways um, that resonate more with the aesthetics that I grew up on. Um, hip hop turns 50 this year and um, I'm closer to 50 than not. So I've never They're known like life with... Yeah, so I've, I've never known life without hip hop and hip hop culture. So for me, it's not like go in the studio and write a quick 16, but that same spirit of um, getting packing a lot of information in um, the density of a bar within the musical density of a bar is actually how I learned to write 
and is how I'm most responsive. So I don't think of the sonnet or I don't think of the haiku. I don't think of these um, other classical forms. I think of the hip hop bar as, you know, the, the structure for, for the work. Um, and then being a spoken word artist um, that is of the hip hop generation, there's kind of another um, subversion of that form, which is less of a subversion in terms of condensing the form and more of a subversion in terms of expanding the form. So I'm not adhering to the metronome of four four time. I am making my own time, um, and something that we um, is alive. I think in the road ahead is that as I'm making my own time with language. Carlos is um, expanding and surrounding that time with melody. And then Rene dimensionalizes that time um, with visual imagery. And Marquis, Do you have, oh, sorry, you go ahead. One, one quick question, one thing, I, I'm curious, if I remember correctly, was Road Ahead you and Carlos's first collaboration? Because Mark and Carlos have gone on to make breathtaking and important work together as composer and librettist. And I would love for you to speak a little bit about the other George Floyd tribute that might be coming out because that might be an unlockable, or that'll be an unlockable for this piece. Meaning whoever buys this piece will also get a copy of Mark and Carlos's latest album, which I think is gonna get an, a Grammy. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. It brought me to tears, and I didn't even uh, just watching it on a screen. So that is a very rare experience. When you experience something live, it's one thing, but to watch something on a screen and be that deeply moved, um, can you talk a little bit about your collaboration with Carlos, and also the fact that I guess we're all siblings in a way. Mark and Carlos went to Morehouse. I went to Spelman College, and we have that tradition of black colleges deep in this process as well. We have yes. Howard mm -hmm. alum with Adrian Wahid. We have Wiley College, that's Austin Dean Ashford. Um, I believe Chris went to FAM. And so we have this very independent spirit that really directly reflects our ancestors' dreams of our great-grandparents. Mm. Um, so I think there's some important stuff that you and Carlos do that I don't want you to, to, to jump past because I think Go the Head was the beginning of it. Am I correct? Yeah, the, the, we so we made an opera together um, called It All Falls Down that was commissioned by the Washington National Opera. We've made the road a, ahead. We are working on a, um, we, are, we are soon to launch and announce a, a new commission by the National Symphony Orchestra. Um, this, we were also commissioned by the Minnesota Orchestra to make a piece uh, in response to the murder of George Floyd. Now, um, the Minnesota Orchestra is housed in Minneapolis. Their concert hall um, is about three, four miles down the road from um, where George Floyd uh, was murdered. Um, we underwent a, a, a really deep and layered process with um, activists, organizers, and citizens from the Twin Cities to create a work called Breadth. And we premiered that work um, in May, um, near the three-year anniversary of George Floyd's murder, um, the live recording of Brett um, was so powerful that uh, it is being released by Decca Classics um, in the next couple of um, weeks, and this is what Kirsten is alluding to. Um, Brett not only uh, was performed with the Minnesota Orchestra um, with a guest conductor, Jonathan Rush, but um, the, the piece was also performed with a 150 person chorus, um, the Minnesota uh, Chorale and different artists from all over South Africa. So it is, I think, the most epic musical response localized um, in the Twin Cities and it corresponds so perfectly with what we're trying to do with Black Dignity Future Classics um, in, in that it is a direct response to trauma, but it it in its output, it centers joy, possibility, and yearning. And so it makes a lot of sense that it would uh, that this album, um, which I, I, I do hope will be well received, um, becomes an unlockable for um, our NFT.
Yes. The other, unlock- yeah. the other unlock I was just, is. Oh, sorry. Is, sorry. The other I was unlock just gonna let her out. with Renee. Um, no, it's cool. I was just gonna let our listeners know that breath is like with and breath with a D in it, but there's a uh, yes. it's a um, parenthetical D. Um, so it's also breath is in the breath that George Floyd lost. Um, sorry, yes. Kirsten, please. Uh, I'm continue. sorry. I was skipping to the next point, but no, I I love that you brought that back up because I mean, again. I think that piece, it's interesting how your work all sort of, it it all circles back to the same idea of, you know, this idea of dignity that the black breath is not even valued. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like this sort of, the the reason for the, the need, the need for black dignity comes from being in this era of just ongoing, ongoing trauma. And it's not even era, being in this country of ongoing, mm. ongoing trauma. We've gone from slavery to Jim Crow to police brutality. Mm. There's never been a breath. There's never been mm. a moment where you just breathe mm. without stress. And so we hope that this work is some type of balm, like a salve, that it helps people, if not for just a moment, experience blackness in a way that is not traumatic, that is peaceful, that is affirming, mm. And, and I particularly hope for, for collectors of color that they find, again, some moment of peace and healing in this black existence that we all go through, um, mm. through what these artists have shared um, very intentionally to heal. So um, that's my hope for the work. And uh, yeah. Mark, I have one question for you, which is kind of for the, the poets who listen to the podcast. We do have... I have worked with a number of poets who specialize in working on in blockchain. Um, So I was wondering if you didn't, you have a very, it sounds like you have a very organic and intuitive um, writing process, but do you have any exercises or, or tips that you might have for writers in the audience? Yeah. You know, I, I write for performance and I have, um, this background in education and the, what I, what I learn, what I have learned, um, particularly, um, through my lineage as a, as an educator, my mom is an educator, my grandmother, my mother's mother, my, my father's father, um, is to, we best communicate through invitation and we best invite, we most humbly invite through honest questions. So someone can present facts to you and um, very often those facts are declarative, they come at you. Someone can ask you a sincere question and if phrased the right way, it doesn't come at you, it draws you in. It invites you to participate intellectually and emotionally in unsettled matter. So my my advice, I guess, would be find the right question. How does a black boy become an American? How does he learn his role to play? And what if that role in part is to stand in his country's closet, waiting for someone to imagine him as a monster in the dark? If I take everything that I love about being black and everything that I love about being an American, are those things themselves in a right or loving relationship? If not some legal charter, who gives us permission to be our greatest loving selves? All those are questions. They, they ask us to answer some answer them together. And I guess maybe that's what I would offer to other writers is along with structure and along with intuition and along with um, the discipline that it takes to be a writer across any platform is just to pay attention not only to the questions that you're asked asking yourself, but the questions that you're asking directly in your writing. 
And you would say that the writing is actually an elaboration of the question, but not necessarily an attempt to answer it? Yeah. As a matter of fact, I think um, one of the gifts that artists give us across genre and across discipline is the provocation. It's not so much the danger of Renee's declaration, it is the danger of the question that she asked, for instance. Why do I think that Jesus should be depicted as a European male? Um, what does it say about the center of the world or the center of religion or the, like, there are questions that are being asked and she's not giving an answer and she's not, she is, she is perhaps um, proposing an alternative response, but really that's what artists do. We, we ask questions and it's that open-endedness that leads to a kind of design thinking, right? By repositioning, I don't know, settled history as open possibility. Um, and that's how we engage, I think, in common aspiration is we, if not relitigate, at the very least, reinvestigate the solid ground beneath us, um, hopefully so we could build or design something better, an equitable future, as opposed to um, a future of capitalist promise. That's beautiful. Um, I do have one final question. This is normally my wrap-up question. Um, and it is, if you had any advice or uh, anything that you've learned in your time as a creative, as an artist, as a, as a um, writer or thinker, that you could, and basically um, an idea around creative process, creativity, art, that you could go and plant in your mind when you were, say, 20, to just give a uh, random number, an arbitrary number. Um, what would you, what, what mental model would you place inside the head of a 20 year old you to give yourself a little more um, wisdom moving forward as a creative? You know, Finn, this is going to sound a little cheesy. I don't know what Kirsten's response is, but um, the, the, the model that I would give myself is, um, I don't know if it's a model, I don't know if it's, if it's pithy, but through this project, I am living the model that I would incept 20 some odd years ago. And, and by that, I mean, um, I, I never invested in my own output. Kirsten gets on me all the time because um, I, I don't really have an archive. I don't. Really, I, I didn't. I, I never thought of what I made, particularly because I I work in time based art. I, I never thought of what I made as commodifiable beyond the lived moment. So I I would say to myself. Um, your work is an asset. Your work is worthy, not only of intrinsic value, but the, the kind of value that um, will support yourself and your family. That your body doesn't have to be implicated in order for your work to have value. Um, it's through the, you know, the kind of integration of the NFT space and um, digital and technological platforms that I'm finally fully able to realize the value of my work outside of my implicated body. I, I wish I had done that much, much earlier. Beautiful. Can I, just chime, in and ask, can I just chime in and ask you a question based on that answer a bit? Um, I think that NFTs have a really, really 
unique use that they haven't been used much for, which is for time-based artists, people who mm -hmm. dance, people who's, because you also, I discovered. The funny thing is Mark and I went to college together and he has become a monster in his world of poetry. And I thought I missed some of those years, but sometimes we'll be walking on the street or encounter people who are like, I saw this thing that you did and it changed my life. And I'm like, it's almost like walking down the street with Prince. Like I used to go to high school with Prince and I'm like, hey Prince, like what do they mean Purple Rain? Do you have a copy of that? Can I see Purple Rain? This thing Purple Rain they're talking to you about? Cause a lot of, you know, Mark's most iconic work, you know, you graduate from school, you go in and out of people's life. I miss these things because they happened once in a moment that I wasn't there. And as someone who works in TV and film, you know, we're about capturing the moment. We're going to milk that thing for you can go watch a movie from the 1920s tomorrow. So that is something that is so um, organic in my process, this idea of documenting and, and preserving. Um, and that's why I kind of fell in love with NFTs is the ability to do that for visual artists, but also for artists who use their physical bodies in a mm -hmm. way that there really hadn't been that thing. Absolutely. Part, I guess it's, it's a two part question, I guess, is how do you see NFTs as being important for time-based artists? And also, because you're also a master of social impact, how do you see NFTs as a tool for social impact? Well, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to go too far down the road. That's probably a whole okay. new episode. But Sorry, I, yes. but I, 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 I will two. just, uh, yeah, I, I, I will just say that maybe one of the reasons um, that I didn't see my work as an asset when I was 20 was because I didn't have the example of the NFT. I, I you know, I, I didn't have this example. I, I thought, um, you know, so many spoken word artists perform in places where visual art is being created live. Um, that piece of art, when you walk away, whatever's on the canvas, it can be sold, but your performance cannot. So, um, some of it is just having the paradigm to to understand how the literary and the techno technological can um, can work together to create equity for everyone, which leads to the impact question. Um, you know, we we make value, and so um, the too often. When we think about social impact, we think about it in terms of reconciling the past. Um, NFTs give us, and, and the equity that's created in the NFT space enables us to think about using value to design the future that we want. So it's not so much about reconciling the past, it's about designing the future, which again is the premise of this whole enterprise. So um, it, it's great to be involved in this way. Um, hopefully, you know, your audiences and beyond will, um, will vibe with us. Um, the, the art is of the highest caliber, um, but it's also part of our future design. So um it's it's more than just these objects it's a movement that um that we want to construct together and kirsten what is the mental model that you would plant in your 20 year old mind the mental related, model that, related to related to creativity um creative process making art um just do the thing um uh. <laughs> I think that is sometimes the greatest challenge is to just do the thing and it is in the imperfections it is in the process it is in what you think might be an error or what seems that you start to find the real beauty of the thing and also that you end up growing as an artist um mm. particularly working in like tv and film and you know, I learned so much by making editing mistakes. You know what I mean? I learned new ways of doing things. I learned the mistake actually was cool. Well, that was a mistake. It wasn't what I intended, but I but I like it. And so to to really also find joy in the process, I, I sometimes feel very, I, sometimes I always feel very blessed that I get to do what I really love and enjoy. And if you are able to engage creativity and make that your livelihood in your career, that is a specific blessing 
and it is something to delight in daily, regardless of the money, which may not come immediately, really, really lean in and enjoy the process because that is really where the magic is. The magic is in the making. The magic is in the mistakes. Um, the magic is in what you learn when you make the mistakes and, and, and nothing actually has to be perfect. Um, in fact, I think artwork is best when there is a, a, an evident human touch of imperfection, something's just a little bit off here or there. Um, and especially as we get into this AI world, I think it's gonna become more of a signature. Um, imperfection is going to really be a human stamp. And so to not beat yourself up about your imperfections, to use your imperfections or the things you're self-conscious about or what you think are flaws, use those things um, as your topic because you'll find your tribe. People connect with those same things that you think are just your demons haunting you. Beautiful. Well, thank you guys so much for taking the time to come on today. Kirsten Backwood and Mark Bamuthi Co. Joseph? I yes. do want to say one thing that we didn't talk about briefly, but I am a big advocate of digital, meaning I'm mostly interested in this digital space, how it intersects real life. I'm not interested in hiding out in the metaverse behind an avatar. I'm interested in connecting people and communities through art. That said, I'm a physical art fan first. I've come to love digital art, but um, one of the very, very special features of these pieces of art that you can buy through this, pro through this project is they're digital, physical and digital. If you buy this piece, you then have the keys to get a physical piece from Art House, who creates canvas prints that are AR enhanced. So if you hang this print on your wall, it's a canvas print, and then you can hold your camera up and you can watch the video. Yeah, through the so, and so I think that's a really unique and special feature. Um, I'm really about melding these two worlds. I want people from the digital world to come back to real life. I want people from the real world to learn how to explore and use these new tools um, of AI, the metaverse, NFTs. And so I think this is a very unique marriage. We have, again, that artists who have been very successful in the NFT space like Charm Taylor, we have artists who are icons like Renee Cox, and we're bringing them together in one place, in one sale, in one conversation, in both a physical and digital way. And so I definitely wanna shout out our partners, Art House, Justin Frederick, um, who helps us bring this beautiful digital work, work to life in a physical form, if you want it. You've got the keys if you've got the NFT. Amazing. And Black Dignity Future Classics, by the time this airs, the charms drop will have already happened, but we've, we've got a lot more coming uh, in the coming weeks. You can drop over to the show notes where all of the links to everything you'll need to know will be there, including links to find more about Mark Bamuthi Joseph and Kirsten Magwood. Um, guys, thanks so much. This has been a pleasure. I really enjoyed talking to you. Um, is there anything else that our audience should know? I have one last thing to say. This is not gonna be a moment, but a movement. So this will be continuing to roll out. There will be real life activations. And if you own this NFT, you become a part of our club. And so we can then talk to you, share with you, tap you in on all of the dope classical music, classical art, classical dance. Um, that is coming um, from some of our future leaders. Um, I live here in Harlem. There's a huge squad of opera singers, classical musicians, um, all who you can check out if you come to New York. And if you buy the NFTs, you may unlock experiences for you to be able to enjoy some of these things IRL. So, and in the metaverse. So stay tuned. Amazing. Well, thanks so much, guys. Y'all have a wonderful day, and I'll talk to y'all soon. Right on. Be safe.